individual execution is one thing, but organizational execution is everything. Having your team operating at a higher level will take you to that next step. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about planning. Now, the first step that we do in the planning process is we have an open planning environment. The general by himself or herself just doesn't come up with the plans up there on the ivory tower and then shoves them down range. We get everybody involved in the planning process that's gonna have an input or have a stake in what's gonna happen. If we plan in silos, then things aren't gonna work. After we determine who's gonna be on our team, the next step is to determine what the mission objective is. Now, this sounds pretty simple, right? It's your goal. What do you want to achieve? Actually, it's one of the hardest parts. And the reason why is that a mission objective must be clear. I'm talking crystal clear. It must be measurable. It must have specific dates and metrics attached to it. It must be achievable, that is believable. Anybody ever been given a goal that you knew you just couldn't get to? Show of hands, yeah. Okay, what happened with that? You paid lip service to it, so to speak. Put it in the circular file, hope nobody noticed. So let's make sure our goals are achievable to our teams and it must support the future picture of where we want our organization to go. Now let me give you a quick example of this. Let's say that uh, yesterday, one of our Air Force brothers or sisters ended up getting shot down. And my commander comes into my squadron and says, Lips, I need you to go protect that down pilot. Is that a good mission objective? No, not really. It's a good idea, it's a great vision, but I need something a little more specific. So let's say my commander comes in and says, Lips, I need you to protect the airspace above the down pilot from zero to 50,000 feet from 1605 to 1817 Zulu. Now, is that clear? Crystal clear. Is it measurable? Sure. I either keep those bad guy airplanes out of that airspace or I don't. Is it achievable? Yes, absolutely. It's definitely within the training I've received and the aircraft I fly, and it definitely does support that future picture of not leaving anyone behind. So how does that apply to you? Well, perhaps if we had a mission objective like this, add new one, add one new one to 5,000 MMR account per month by December 31st, 2012. Is that clear? Yes. Absolutely. It's crystal clear. Is it measurable? Yes. Sure, you either do that per month or you don't. Is it achievable? Yes? yes? yes. Yeah, I, you're the ones that are going to have to determine that. This is an example. But it definitely supports a future picture of having that recurring rev revenue and taking it to the next level. It's a good mission objective. The point that I'm getting at is when you set out goals or objectives for yourselves, more importantly, as leaders for your teams, make them clear and measurable. Sometimes we, we don't want to tell our people exactly what they need to do. Well, actually, you know what? You're doing them a disservice. Tell them exactly what you want the result to look like and then let them go execute. Make sure they're clear and measurable. Once we've determined our mission objective, we then identify the threats or the obstacles that are gonna stand in our way. Now, most times, most people think of those external threats. If you think of Coke, who's their threat? Pepsi, Pepsi right? Well, Coke can't really do anything about Pepsi. It's how Coke executes. Now, this is one of my external threats. This is an SA-3 Goa. It's a former Soviet Union missile. It's uh, longer than a telephone pole, flies five times faster than my aircraft, can pull up to 27 Gs. How many can I pull? Nine, okay, so that's really bad. And oh, by the way, there's a warhead on the very tip of it that's designed to take me out of the sky. So I learn about this threat, and then I start looking at the resources that I have. But I also focus on the internal threats to my organization. We open up all the cupboards, all the closets, pull up the carpet, and we line up every internal and external obstacle that'll keep us from achieving our goals. And then we determine which ones are controllable and which ones aren't. The ones that we can influence or put resources into or against and change, those are the ones we're gonna plan around. As a fighter pilot, I can't do anything about the weather. So we're gonna actually talk about that a little bit longer, uh, further down in the process. So just some brief examples of threats you may be faced. Economic pressures, operational costs, pricing issues, client education, becoming a trusted advisor, new technology, employee issues. We line them all up. We don't ignore any of them. We get them up on the board, and then we look at planning around them. Because the next step in the process is to identify the available resources. What tools or techniques or processes or people 
or programs do we have on our team that'll allow us to be successful? Now we talked about that SA3 go, right? Very bad day when one of those joins up on you and starts flying formation. So what do we do? We have other aircraft that are designed, they carry high-speed anti-radiation missiles, and they actually shoot missiles down the radar beam before that thing comes up. So we identify what our threat is, and then we apply a resource against it. So what are some resources that you have? Employees. Employees? What else? Robin. Robin. Good, I preloaded the slide. What do I have? Robin's sales and marketing team, right? Your technicians, your employees, your peers, the individuals sitting in this room, do not pass up this golden opportunity when you're all here at the boot camp to communicate with each other, ask questions, and pass ideas back and forth. And then the people that you have on your team. You'd be amazed when you open up those lines of communication, you invite them into the planning process, some of the good ideas that they have. And oh, by the way, if the ideas don't really match where you want to go, it's a chance for you as a leader to communicate and to educate and bring everybody on, on board and have you operate as a team. But you know what? There's one, uh, one resource that's so valuable, we give it its own step, and that's step number four, evaluate lessons learned. Now, these lessons learned and best practices come out of the debrief, and we'll talk about how to design those a little bit later. But we always, always review what happened before, not just within our own squadron, but out of other squadrons as well. Now, who can tell me what this gentleman is wearing on his eyes? Night vision goggles. Anybody ever wear a pair of night vision goggles? Okay, they're pretty awesome, right? How many fighter pilots do we have in the room? I know we got one. We got another one? one? Would you fly, sir? Uh oh. All right, we're going to make fun of the Navy a little bit later on today, folks. Since there's two of them and only one of me, that's about the average odds. All right, I'm going to leave that one alone, <laughs> to, to be politically correct. Um, he's wearing night vision goggles. Okay, with night vision goggles on, you can see absolutely everything. You would be surprised what you can see. Now, in 2009, I actually fly F-18s. I'm still in the reserves. I fly out of Southern California down San Diego. Anybody from San Diego, Los Angeles area? We got a couple people. Okay, right over the mountains is what? Desert. Okay, so I'm used to flying in a desert environment. Now, how many people are from Dallas, Texas? Okay, anybody ever been through Dallas, through the airport? For, for those who have raised their hands, how many deserts are in and around Dallas, Fort Worth area? None. How many big mountains? I'm not talking about the mole hills up by Austin, but big mountains. None. Uh, gigantic blowing sandstorms? None. So how do you take a squadron that operates in and around Dallas, Texas, and drop them into an environment where they're flying at night on MVGs, in a desert environment, mountainous terrain, blowing sandstorms. Well, what we have is a lesson learned database. And what we did as a unit was that we gathered all the lessons learned from the previous six years of all the squadrons that went before us. All the good things they did and all the bad things they did. And we learned from that. So when we arrived on site 12 hours later, we were able to fly combat missions. But we also used it to get overseas because we had to fly 12 F-18s on six, excuse me, five tankers with four other support aircraft from Dallas to Maine to Spain to Sicily and then into Iraq and we had to do it in six days. And we did it flawlessly and it's not because we're better pilots and it's not because we had better Marines. It's because we were able to learn what we needed to do based on the experience of others and those who have gone before us. Evaluating lessons learned is critically, critically important. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel or to have to put your finger in the candle to learn that it's hot. In fact, being here at the boot camp and the experience that's uh, being provided in the education is a method of passing on those lessons learned, those best practices. So always incorporate those. And now we actually sit down and we design what we're going to do to reach that ch uh, mission objective. Who's going to do what by when? First thing we do is we brainstorm. How many people brainstorm? Okay, very good. How many brainstorm as a group where we bring everybody in the planning and we all brainstorm together? Anybody ever heard the term group think? Okay, well, when we brainstorm, we like to divide our groups up so that we don't get into that situation where everybody's going down the same path. Anybody know somebody that likes to dominate the conversation? Okay, all right. 
Well, there are other good ideas and we want to facilitate those going out. So if you have the opportunity, we like to divide our groups up, uh, excuse me, divide our teams up into three subgroups. And we have them all come up with ideas. Now, if you look up on the board, the number three group is unconstrained, right? Our out of the box, our dream sheet group. And the reason why we do that, in fact, let me ask this question. How many of you have ever been in a meeting and said, wouldn't it be a good idea if, and that got shot down before you got to complete that thought? Okay, probably all of us at some point. But you know what? What if that idea is so good that you'll find the time and money and resources to apply to it? So we split our groups up, we each plan, and then we come back together. And we analyze and finalize each of those different courses of action. And we start prioritizing them. One has to happen. Number eight is a nice to have. But we don't stop there because once we come up with our plan, we use a red team. Now, our red team are our workplace counterparts, our squadron mates, the advisory board, each with different levels of experience. And we brief them on our plan, and we ask for their feedback. We empower them to shoot holes in our plan. In fact, in my squadron, I bet beers on it, whether or not they can determine or come up with five mistakes. Ladies and gentlemen, I bought a lot of beer for my squadron mates in my time, okay? Now, as a leader, we all fall in love with our own plans. I don't argue with these individuals. I don't question the validity of anything they bring up. I just want their information. In fact, the only time I answer a question is if it needs clarity. I just say, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I have another. I write it down because they weren't in on the original planning session. So if it's something we considered, great. But every time I have done this with one of our clients in one of our workshops, I have seen plans change based on the red team concept. And then we develop our final plan. But when we do that, we put in who is going to do what specifically by when. Who is going to do what by when. So we can assign accountability and responsibility and everybody has clarity in what they're supposed to do. So at the end of step number five, who thinks we have a perfect plan? Anybody? No? After all that work? Does anything in this world ever go exactly how it's planned? No, not very often. And that's why we always include step number six the contingencies, the what ifs. What if, in my world, 16 enemy aircraft show up instead of the four that my intelligence officer said they had? What if uh, I get to overhead the target and it's completely covered by clouds? What are we gonna do? What if 20 miles prior to the first target, that's me, and I get shot down out of the sky? Do the rest of the flight members continue on or do they turn around and go home? What if in your world, you fall behind your lead generation, your sales projections for the year? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna change? How are you gonna handle that? What if on your biggest deal for the year, your client doesn't see the value of your proposal? Or they turn around and say, hey, you know what? I can get it cheaper somewhere else. Do you compete on price or do you compete on value? And you educate them. What if your top technician the top person that's in your company that's been there for the last 10 years, 15, 20 years, that's really been the, the rock, the foundation, what if they come in Monday morning and they go, hey, you know what, it's been a great run, but uh, I'm out of here. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna handle those situations? We ask these questions now. What if my airplane catches on fire? What if it goes out of control? We talk about them in the plan, in the brief, in an air-conditioned room with our boots up on the table. So that when we're out there executing and these pop up, we don't react to them, we respond because we already have a plan in place. What if, what if, what if? And once we've developed our plan and we ask those what ifs, we then move on. But the one thing I want you to remember is that flexibility is the key to air power, but we take that one step further and say that preparation is the key to flexibility. 